Thank you, Al. All right. So, uh, as he said, my job is generally to prosecute um, crimes against children, particularly sex crimes. Uh, I've also had some history uh, prosecuting adult sex crimes. So, um, I'm here to give you all some information about um, sexual violence and uh, sort of bring that uh, bring awareness to that topic. So, some statistics uh, nationwide. About one in five college women are victims of sexual violence while they're in college. Uh, I know a lot of times we think of these uh, types of crimes as being primarily uh, crimes against women, uh, but also one in seven college men are victims of sexual violence while they're in college. And uh, another common misconception is that, uh, you know, when we think of uh, sexual assaults or rapes, we often think about um, sort of the man kidnapping somebody off the street um, and uh, committing that kind of sexual violence. But uh, in reality, about 90% of the victims of sexual violence know their perpetrator. Um, and also, these statistics probably underreport the actual scope of the problem because sexual violence crimes are some of the least reported crimes um, of, of any crimes that we deal with. The estimates are somewhere around 68% of sexual assaults are not reported to the police. Also, while you're in college, this is a particularly dangerous time um, for um, people to be the uh, victims of sexual assault. Um, male college students are about five times more likely than similar age non-students, so those who are not in college. So that's uh, also something that makes this hopefully particularly relevant to you. In Texas, uh, we have about 6.3 uh, million adult Texans who have experienced sexual assault. That's roughly about a third of Texans at some point in their life experienced sexual assault. Um, two thirds of those are, are women, about 4.2 million, and about one third men 2.1 million uh, and similar to the national statistics 70 percent of those victims of sexual assault are uh no they're they're by somebody known to the victim um, and again this is a underreported uh crime here in texas just like it is nationally the estimates are maybe about 9.2 percent of sexual assaults are actually reported to police and it's certainly going to be no surprise that uh, alcohol. I'm sorry, is, I, I hear a little feedback. Are you able? Was everybody able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Coach. Okay. Good. Sorry about that. I, um, so, uh, and it's very common for sexual assaults to be facilitated either by drugs or alcohol, uh, because that puts people in a position where they're less able uh, to protect themselves. There are some myths that surround sexual assault and rape. Uh, one of those we've already talked about, and that's that most rapes are committed by strangers. Uh, in reality, um, depending on the study you look at, somewhere around 75% of rapes are committed by someone known to the victim. That includes uh, a casual acquaintance, a current or former significant other, or a non-spouse relative. Um, and a, another myth is that people that rape rapes are commonly falsely reported. The truth is uh, the best evidence that we have is that about two to eight percent of rapes might be false report of rape reports are false. And that's the same as most other crimes, uh, burglaries, robberies, assaults, things like that. So uh, while there are false accusations of rape, they're relatively rare and they're no more common than for other types of crime. Another uh, common rape myth is that if somebody doesn't report the rape immediately, it means that it's less likely to occur. The truth is uh, rape, just like any other trauma, different people process that differently. Um, and certainly a delayed disclosure is not uncommon. Uh, it's not unusual at all for a person to take several days uh, to come to terms or to begin to come to terms and process what's been done to them. Uh, and even months or years 
are not uncommon at all. Uh, another common misconception is that if there was really a rape, then there'll be signs of physical trauma. Uh, you might remember, uh, I originally practiced in the state of Missouri several years ago. There was a candidate for public office uh, who said something along the lines, if it's a, a legitimate rape, then the body just shuts that down and it's not possible to get pregnant. That's a myth. That's sort of an absurd, ridiculous myth. Um, in, in many, many sexual assault cases, there are going to be no signs of physical trauma. Um, we certainly do not expect people uh, who might be smaller, and less strong than their attackers to make that situation worse by trying to fight tooth and claw and maybe uh, in addition to the sexual assault, put themselves in a, in a situation where they could be hurt very badly or even killed. Uh, so in many cases, uh, you can't have sexual assaults and there's not necessarily uh, bruises or other kinds of physical trauma indicative of it. Uh, it. Sometimes this is called, it's normal to be normal. And a rape survivor can have a perfectly normal um, physical examination and that certainly does not mean that the rape didn't occur. So uh, again, sort of specific to you, uh, maybe your concerns. So there, I work in the criminal law system. Um, that means that uh, when somebody breaks a law, I represent the state of Texas and try to hold them accountable for the laws they broke. And there are some differences between that system and uh, the system of discipline at a place like Lone Star College uh, where they um, can make determinations on discipline um, as, a, as a college student, and that's under Title IX of the U.S. Code. So in the criminal system, we have the highest burden known to law. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. Before we can hold somebody accountable uh, for any crime, and particularly a, a sexual crime, we have to prove to a jury or a judge uh, that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, in, a, in a college like Lone Star, um, the burden is lower. It's preponderance of the evidence. That's like kind of 51%, just more likely than not. Um, the definition under criminal law, uh, consent does not include force, violence, or coercion, or the threat thereof. Uh, if somebody is unconscious or physically unable to resist, um, that's not consent. You, a person who's unconscious cannot consent. Uh, if a person is unaware that the sexual assault is occurring, they are unable to consent. And if the actor, uh, the, the person who's doing the sexual assault, has intentionally impaired the victim's power to appraise and control their conduct um, by administering a substance. So um, if you are involuntarily intoxicated um, and that makes you unable because your um, rapist has given you something, drugs or alcohol, that makes you unable to appraise or control uh, the situation, then you are incapable of consent. The definition in college is a little, is a little different. Consent, um, so these are things that consent includes. Voluntary and positive agreement between the participants to engage in sexual activity. Um, so it has to be voluntary and you have to consent to, to any of the sexual activity and that consent has to be clear and unambiguous. Um, and if you're mentally or physically incapacitated either through the effect of drugs or alcohol, then that person is not capable of consent. Now you'll notice under the criminal law, um, consent, uh, you, the, the uh, person um, has to, the, the actor or the suspect has to, um, it has to uh, give the person, uh, it has to be the one who impairs the victim's power uh, to appraise or control their conduct, whereas uh, in the civil area at college, when you're talking about potentially being disciplined, um, it doesn't matter uh, if the actor was the one who gave the person alcohol or not, or drugs or impaired uh, or incapacitated the person. Um, it's if somebody is un incapable of consent because they're drunk or because they're under the influence of drugs, it doesn't matter if the person, if the other person gave them or not. Um, in the criminal system, there are robust due process rights. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right uh, to an attorney. You have all of the other rights that are part of our system. You can only be convicted 
Um, if a jury, you have a right to a jury. So if you want a jury, you get one in the criminal law context, but, uh, and, and there's lots of other due process rights, uh, including the right to cross-examine your accuser. Um, in the civil proceedings, like at Lone Star, you might have less due process rights, uh, including um, you may not have the right to cross-examine the accuser, the person who says they were raped, things like that. In the criminal law, if I can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you've committed a sexual assault, you're most likely going to prison. Um, the most that Lone Star College could do uh, is to expel you from school. And of course, that's that's a serious sanction, um, but not as serious as having your liberty taken away. And that's why the burden of proof is lower and the due process rights are less. There is a lot of common sense when it comes to this, right? I mean, it is, um, when in doubt, assume that you don't have consent. Um, some things that consent is not, um, just because somebody dresses a certain way or flirts or kisses or anything else, that doesn't mean that they're consenting for full on sex or that they're consenting for anything more than what they've talked about. Um, if somebody's under the age of legal consent, then it doesn't matter if, if it appears that they consent or not. Uh, if they're, So in Texas, that's 17 years old. If you're under 17, you cannot consent to sex. That does not count as consent. Uh, if somebody's incapacitated because of drugs or alcohol, that's not consent. Uh, like, you know, like in the video, if somebody's unconscious, they don't want tea and they don't want sex. Um, pressuring somebody into to sexual activity by threats or intimidation, that's not consent. Consent that is what, assent that is, um, that is procured by threats or intimidation is not consent. Um, and just because you've had permission in the past to engage in, engage in a sexual act, that doesn't mean that you can in the future. Um, and it's it, we've heard it a thousand times, but it's true. No means no. And a, a person can say no at any point in the conver at any point in the interaction. Um, once the person says no, you have to stop. Period. There's no there's no question. There's no well. Um, I you know just a little bit more, anything like that. When the word no comes out, it's time to stop. That's in, I can't put it any more plainly than that. Um, no means no, we say that for a reason. And I know sometimes in our culture, we have maybe some confusing messages like this, like this clip from a movie when that came out when I was uh, a young guy from a famous scene. So in this scene, you know, it's a, the the girl has previously told him that uh, their relationship is over and this is the grand gesture to get her back. Uh, while that works well in movies, in real life, it's more like stalking. Um, and so when somebody says thanks, but no thanks, you have to accept that. Um, so what should you do if you see somebody in danger, somebody uh, who you're not sure if they're in a position to be able to consent? Um, if, if there's some sexual activity going on and they seem drunk or out of it or incoherent, one, you can ask directly. Uh, if you don't think you can do that safely, call an authority figure, you know, a, a police officer, some other person, or get help from another person. So you might remember the Stanford rape case, uh, an All-American swimmer at Stanford, you know, somebody who had the whole world in front of him, uh, you know, the, at an elite institution, uh, an elite athlete, and uh, he wound up um, having sex with an unconscious person and in many ways ruined his life, even though uh, the penalty was much less than what was probably justice in that case. So if you're, if you're ever in that situation, right, you want to be uh, the, the last guy, uh, Carl Frederick. You want to be that guy, you know, he's a hero. He saw something inappropriate, illegal, disgusting going on. And uh, he, well, he, you know, he was too late to stop the sexual assault. He helped uh, hold the uh, Brock Turner responsible. You don't want to be Brock. You know, you don't want to be the guy who throws his life away uh, because he makes a, a, a decision to, to hurt somebody. So if you are, are in that situation, 
uh, you know, if you um, see somebody in that situation, be Carl Frederick, be a hero, uh, save people. Uh, don't be one of the bad guys. Uh, so a, a few rape prevention tips. And I know sometimes um, people say we should focus on the rapist. Well, and, and I agree with that 100 percent that there's only one person who's responsible for rape, and it is the rapist. That is 100 percent of the fault lies on him. But there are bad people in the world. Um, I, I mean, in the last 15 years, I've prosecuted a lot of very, very bad people. And at the end of the day, there's nothing that I can do in the criminal justice system that is going to make a rape OK. No matter how much time I get, no matter how much punishment we get, that's not going to, to fix what was done to the victim. Um, so to the extent that we can, we want to take some common sense steps to avoid that. And those things include things like uh, having a buddy system. Um, if you're going to go out, uh, if you're going to be in a position where you're going to be drinking, Make a plan to be with friends and be a good friend. Don't don't abandon your friend in a potentially dangerous situation. If you're at a party or if you're at a bar, and uh, even if your friend is is being drunk and stupid, you don't leave them alone. Uh, you never leave a man behind, if that makes sense. Uh, and when you're in those situations, protect your drink. Um, if you go to the bathroom, either pour your drink out uh, and get a new one or take it with you, never leave it alone, um, and never drink uh, alcohol that you don't know what's in it. Um, so if you've got a party and there's a, you know, like a punch or something like that, um, don't, don't drink alcohol or cocktails that you don't know what, what they contain. Uh, also know your limits. Uh, don't put yourself in a position where you're um, too drunk to protect yourself. Not that that makes it your fault. It doesn't. Um, and not that it makes it, not that the, it's the victim's responsibility, but at the same time, um, we all have to take um, steps to try to keep ourselves safe. And of course, it's it's perfectly fine to lie to get yourself out of a situation. If you find yourself in a bad situation, it's okay to say that you have a headache or that you have to wake up early in the morning or or whatever lie gets you out of the situation, you should absolutely feel free to do that. If you have a friend that may have been victimized uh, by sexual assault, um, there are some some warning signs to look out for, and you can see them there. Like if you had if you see a, a friend with thoughts of suicide or suicidal behavior, if they have markedly low self esteem, um, sexually transmitted infections. Anxiety or changes in behavior, things like that, uh, including if their if their grades go down suddenly or if there's a market increase in drug or alcohol use, those are all warning signs. Maybe if you see a friend going through those things, you might want to touch base with them and ask them: Is there is there is everything okay? Is there anything I can do to help? Uh, if a friend does disclose to you, the first thing you should do is start by believing. As I said. Uh, False allegations of rape are very, very unusual. Um, they are very much the exception, not the rule. Uh, so we should all start from a place of saying, if somebody is saying they've been raped, the the it is the most likely outcome is reason for that is because they've been raped. One thing that you can say is it's not your fault, and you didn't do anything to deserve this. Uh, people who have been sexual assault victims often think. Why did I put myself in this situation? Or if I had maybe um, I let him on or may, maybe I made her think that I was interested in this or something along those lines. Um, it is never, ever the victim's fault, period. Um, you can also tell them that you're, that you're there to help and preserve evidence. Oftentimes, um, people who have been through a sexual assault, uh, they want to, they, they feel tainted. So they wash their clothes or their bedding, they take out the trash, things like that. That is all vital evidence uh, for me and my business to be able to hold offenders accountable um, and also connect the person to resources. Uh, there are times when things are going to be um, beyond your ability to help. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out to experts if uh, to, to get those resources 
Um, sometimes that's the best thing that you as a friend can do is to connect somebody to, to somebody who can help better than you. Uh, and here are some resources. Uh, the National Sexual Assault Hotline, you see that. It's 1-800-656-HOPE. Uh, you can also chat online if you go uh, online. And in this area, you can see several of the organizations that help victims of sexual assault uh, in the Houston area. So that's the end of my presentation. So if anybody has any questions. Great, thank you so much, Chris. If you guys have questions, you can ask those down in the chat box and we'll definitely uh, have them uh, ready for Chris to answer. While, we're doing, while they're doing that, Chris, I'll start off with a question. Uh, what can someone expect in the examining room when they have been assaulted and decided to report it? What are some of the steps or things that they will go through in a sense of uh, medical exam? Sure. So that sex assault nurses exam uh, is, is what it's often called uh, is uh, nothing is going to happen to you you don't want to happen. Uh, for the exam that you tolerate um, they're not going to something in to do so i if you have a fear about going to get attention uh, because you think, well, if I do this, then, uh, you know, they're going to poke and prod and whatever. Now, I will say, if if the victim can tolerate that, that's the way we collect evidence, and that evidence can be absolutely invaluable. Um, they're not going to make a police report unless you want a police report made. Um, one thing, if you've been the victim of sexual assault, uh, if you do get an exam quickly, um, then they can preserve that evidence, and if you decide later that you might want to pursue charges, then the evidence will be collected. But if the evidence is not collected and you decide later that you want to pursue charges, that makes the case much more difficult um, to successfully prosecute. Um, other things, you'll get emergency birth control, uh, so emergency prophylaxis, um, and you'll also get emergency um, or, treatment, prophylactic for sexually transmitted infections. Um, so their job, uh, while they do collect evidence that can be used, their job is to treat the patient. It's not to help the prosecution. Um, so anybody who's been sexually assaulted, I would very much recommend um, getting the medical treatment uh, that you can get. All it does is create options for the future and it makes sure that that you're healthy and normal, and if there are any issues uh, that they need to address medically, then they can address those issues. And also connect you with resources. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, I'll ask another until they send their questions. Um, what if someone tells their friend that they've been sexually assaulted but they don't want their friend to tell anyone. What's the friend supposed to do now? So, um, if they are safe, um, you know these are these are tough waters to navigate, right? Uh, if somebody's in a dangerous situation and they're going back to uh, their the rapist um, and to a, a dangerous situation, then you have to sort of weigh. Um, you know, the, the consequences of not letting people know. Uh, we don't want to re-victimize people. We don't want to put them through uh, additional trauma. But at the end of the day, um, I, I think probably the best thing to do as a friend is to encourage them to make the choice to go to the authorities. Uh, the rapists count on the fact that this is an underreported crime. People who will commit sexual violence, they count on the fact that it is one of the most underreported crimes that there is. Uh, so I think you try to give them support uh, as a friend and you try to gently encourage them uh, to get help to help safe and to hold the offender accountable.
Thanks. Anyone else? Any questions? Okay, I'm trying to think of another. <laughs> um, over the years, you said 15 years and 13 years. Is there a particular profile of a, a person that does this kind of act? I, I, I wish I could tell you that, you know, um, rapists or um, people who sexually harm children, you know, that they had uh, fangs and horns. Uh, so you could see them coming. Uh, but the truth is, a, a lot of these people, uh, they're actually quite charming and manipulative. Manipulative. Um, so uh, it, there's not really a profile other, other than it is often going to be somebody that the victim knows. Um, so it's going to be the, the stranger rape cases uh, that, you know, are actually quite rare. Uh, people getting kidnapped off the street and, and you know, uh, taken someplace and being sexually assaulted. Uh, that's that's rare. Um, the the most common situation is an acquaintance, uh, a boy, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend uh, or uh, some other person who's already in the victim's life. So the, the date rape scenario is much more common than the stranger rape scenario. But as far as a, a profile, you know, somebody to avoid or a type of person to avoid, I wish that it were that easy, but it's just not. Okay. And I know that this does happen to men, and typically <clears throat> men will not want to come forth. Um, what, I guess, could you say to encourage a guy? Um, you know, sometimes I think that masculinity thing comes in and you know, the macho part. Um, help help me out with that a little bit. <laughs> sure, and, and you know, and, and when you talk about masculinity and you talk about strength, it takes more strength to come forward. And I've certainly had many cases, particularly in the child sex area, where um, people don't come forward come forward to protect themselves. They come forward when the abuser moves on to a younger sibling. Uh, so they're more interested in protecting somebody than, you know, they're more worried about somebody else than they're about themselves. Uh, and I think it's the same for men. The way to look at it is rapists don't stop. Rapists are stopped. You know, they don't stop on their own. Uh, they're going to continue to engage in that behavior until somebody stops them. Uh, and it takes more courage. If you want to talk about courage, if you want to talk about strength and, and being a strong, uh, uh, you know, uh, protective male, uh, it takes a lot more strength and a lot more courage to come forward than to not. Um, so uh, maybe we just need to flip the paradigm on what masculinity means and what that, what that strong male uh, role model type scenario is. Which is uh, that it actually, it, it takes more strength to come forward than it does uh, to, to not. And the idea here is, sure, you'll get, we'll try to get justice uh, for yourself, but you also are gonna protect others. Uh, if you wanna be a protector, if you wanna be a hero, uh, that is an opportunity. Thank you. Anyone else? The floor is definitely open for questions. Yeah, they're just popping in my head right now. <laughs> Typically, I guess, is it a longer sentence for someone that uh, assaults an adult or a child, or is it a long, how, how long has the assault been going on? What does that look like? I think that helps people to come forward when they know someone can go away for a long time opposed to, you know, a short time. Sure. And um, people are very protective of uh, while all sexual violence is terrible, I think the you know sort of the the typical person um, thinks that sexual abusing a child is is worse. Uh, although both are very very serious crimes with long ranges of punishment. Um, in Texas, we have uh, really big ranges of punishment. 
Uh, so depending on the sex crime, it's going to be two to 20 years or five to 99 years or life um, or even uh, 25 to 99. So we have big ranges um, and it really comes down to um, what the 12 people in, you know, who are on the jury decide is justice and decide is, you know, so there's the, the potential for long sentences, um, but it really is very dependent on the facts. Um, certainly the more violent the rape, the longer the sentence, um, the, if we can prove uh, that it's part of a pattern, multiple victims mean most likely we'll get longer sentences. Uh, if they have um, been previously convicted of a crime of sexual violence, then they're much more likely to get uh, longer sentences. Um, so, but it really is very fact specific to the cases. All right. Thank you. And I saw that you had the Montgomery County uh, Women's Center did an excellent presentation for us yesterday. They were one of the resources. Um, could you do this right before we end? Uh, if anyone doesn't have any other questions, is maybe show that resource um, list again, if it wouldn't be too much trouble. Someone can, you know, sure. take shots of it to know who to contact for those resources. Let me reshare my screen here. <laughs> yeah. And and the National Sex Assault Hotline can put yeah. you in touch uh, with resources. And also, you know, I I think people are just getting away from talking on the telephone. So there's also that online chat. Okay. Uh, and I know it can be difficult to, to talk about these topics, um, you know, sort of with somebody. Sometimes it's easier to type than it is to talk. So mm -hmm. there's also that chat option. Okay. All right. All right. If there aren't any more questions, I definitely want to thank you, Chris, for a job well done as usual. Of course. Uh, thank you, Thanks Christian, for, for collaborating. Me. Yes, sir. Uh, and also thank the students and the staff that participated today. Um, we just want to say thank you so much. Uh, Chris, uh, I'll see you soon, hopefully. Uh, but I definitely know we'll be calling you back to get more information and, uh, you know, talk about some other things dealing with this subject and some that are very closely related. Um, but definitely students, we want to say stay connected, um, study for your exams, let us know if you need us. Uh, the resource centers are there, the Women's Center and the Culture Center, uh, and also the Men's Center, of course. But thank you guys and have a good rest of your day, and we'll see you soon. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.